You ready for this? Let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask his blessing on this message tonight. Father, thank you for your word. I just uh, yield myself to you, Holy Spirit, because without you, uh, we don't have the truth that we need. We don't have the mind of Christ. But when we yield to you and we study your word, uh, I thank you that you bring things back to our remembrance. You lead and guide us into truth. And for that, I thank you. And I ask that you just bless everybody that's here tonight and open up their ears and the eyes of their understanding and help them to be enlightened to the truth of their inheritance in Jesus Christ tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. How many of you can see that uh, it's pretty easy right now for everybody, not only in the United States, uh, but in the world, to just be hopeless. Yeah, right? Come on. Sometimes, man, you just, you get, you get yourself kind of like, yeah, you come to church, you get pumped up, and you go back out, and you see something in the news, or you hear about something, and you just go, I just can't believe that this is my country. I can't believe that the world is so crazy. And, you know, if you're not careful, it'll steal your hope. I mean, I have to fight it. You have to fight it. Uh, one, of the, one of the great things, though, being a Christian is we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hope tonight. But first, I want to, I want to go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Just going to read a little portion of Scripture there. You can either turn there or you can just listen as I read it. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 12, it says that we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. And verse 13 says, But now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love, or charity, love in action. Love that, uh, actually, you know, when you look up that word in, in certain Greek texts, it means hospitality. It's, it's a word... That I mean, it can mean a lot of different things. Love and action, you know. Uh, when you look at it, it, it can it can uh, it can exemplify people that are like missionaries or or folks that run soup kitchens and things like that. But it also means hospitality because it has to do with taking care uh, of business. You know what I mean? Taking care of people that are poor, taking care of, of people when they come to your house, you know, being hospitable, and it's a, it's a form of love and action. And so it says these three, faith, hope, and love. And so Christian, Christianity, we got we to gotta think about this, and I'm going to throw this out here for you for your edification. But Christianity is a anchored on two events. Now there's other events, but... Two major events. What do you think they are? Some people call it Christmas and Easter. I don't really like Easter that much, but that's what people use. But it's, it's uh, incarnation and resurrection. The incarnation of Jesus Christ, and uh, it's predicated, our, uh, our faith is predicated, our hope is predicated on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Christianity finds its, ex its expression though through faith, hope, and love. And it rests upon two, two commandments, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen? So we rest on those two pillars or those commandments. Uh, has Jesus thrown out the Ten Commandments? No. He fulfilled the law and the prophets, but he condensed the Ten Commandments into two. How many of you understand, I believe the, the first four are to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and, and uh, not to bow to idols and so forth. And the last, the last six are about how you deal with people. Amen? And so uh, we are people that are defined by A, faith. It's what we believe, right? Faith is what we believe. I mean, what do you believe about Jesus? Who do men say that I am? I say that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The only hope for a fallen man is Jesus Christ and salvation through faith in him alone. Amen? Amen? It's not based on my works. Uh, Ephesians 2.8 says we're saved by grace through faith. 
that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man could boast. In other words, there's not going to be any boasting when you stand before the Lord about the great works you've done or how much you've uh, uh, shown charity and love and action, which you should do. That's not going to save you. Only a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ will save you, and it will be your ticket into heaven, whether or not you know Jesus as Savior and Lord, by faith in Him alone. So we're people defined by what we believe, which is faith, what we expect. Now faith is, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, the substance of things hoped for. So when the things that we hope for become substance or right now, in the now, that's faith. Okay? Faith, what we believe, what we expect. Hope is our expectation of the things that God has said belongs to us or that we can have according to his word. Amen? So we're people divine by, we're defined by faith, what we believe, what we expect, which is hope, and how we relate towards others, which is love. So faith, hope, and love. You get that? So faith is our foundation. Amen? We're built upon Jesus Christ. And him crucified. He's our rock. Faith is our foundation. Hope is our attitudinal anchor. Amen. You know, I, there's certain things that I don't have to hope for anymore because now that I'm in Christ and I study his word, by faith I just receive things. I receive what God's word says is mine. Uh, you know, there's certain things that I, I have in my salvation package. Amen. I have, I have the right to have the peace of mind. I have, first of all, I have the right to have peace between God and me through Jesus Christ. He's the, the one who put us together, amen? I've always say this when I'm talking about, about uh, our relationship with God in relation to the Sistine Chapel where you've got that figure up there that's supposed to represent the Father and you got man reaching out to get a hold of him and they don't quite connect. Well, Jesus should be in the middle of that grabbing God's hand and grabbing man's hand and going and connecting them together because he's the great celestial go-between between God and man, amen? And so he's the one that, uh, that we come to God through. So faith is our foundation, hope is our attitudinal anchor, love is our motive, so we're part of the Jesus nation. This is something that we've got to get in our minds right now. I know Woody reiterated some things that, that I've been talking about. You know, I mean, uh, my focus is on the kingdom of God more than it is on this kingdom. Does that mean I'm just going to run from this kingdom, that there's no responsibility to my generation, to my country, to the world uh, as far as, you know, my life is concerned? Absolutely not. Um, one of the biggest jobs that you and I have right now is to pray against the, the powers of darkness that are trying to push their way into the world and spreading their message of hopelessness. Because we have a message of hope. You know, and that, and that encroachment uh, by the powers that be, and when I talk about the powers that be, I'm talking about the principalities and powers that work with the demonic level. Amen. Those that blanket a, a culture, blanket an area, uh, even, you know, in where we live right now, we have some certain particulars that they use to oppress the people of this, this region. And then there's those that are even bigger than what's here that oppress the whole land. They're working through human beings, just like God works through us. You know, we're, God, we're Jesus' feet and hands down here on this earth. We're his mouthpiece on this earth. We're also, he's also invested in us uh, some saltiness. Amen? If you lose your saltiness, then you're not good for anything. And, and take that right, because he says it in one of the most extreme terminology so that we'll understand that we've got to, we've got to stay salty. We've got to stay... Uh, in a, in a position of authority, understanding and knowing that even though we're in the world, there's a part of us that's not a part of this world. And that part that, that's born again, that Jesus has invested his authority in, and that he's invested his purpose in, and he's invested his will in, we have the ability to be a restraining factor by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. 
Being led by God's Spirit causes us to grow into maturity and become the manifested sons of God in this earth. And of course, we're waiting for that, that full, complete adoption when we take on the same form that Jesus has. But right now, in our inner man, we have that grace package that caused us to be born again, that gives us back the authority that Satan cheated our, our forefather and mother out of. Jesus got it back for us. So when we're walking in this earth, what we got to do is we got to quit letting uh, the mind of the flesh and these principalities and powers that are blanketing everything with fear and with hopelessness, we can't get caught up in it. We're kingdom agents. And when we do start to get caught up in it, we got to draw back from that and cling to Jesus and to the truth and the hope that's in him so that we can keep this, this tide of evil back for as long as is possible. It's pushing in, church. There's nothing, there's nothing in the end result that's going to keep it from coming. It will come. It's ordained to come. It's ordained to have seven years on this earth, but not until we're out of here. I just heard a great man of God today, and I'm not going to mention his name. Somebody asked him the question, uh, what about the rapture of the church? Is it, is it pre or mid or post? Are we going to have to go through the tribulation? He goes, well, yeah, we're going to go through the tribulation. And he's on every channel 20 times a day. And, and he just created confusion in the body of Christ. He'd have been better off if he would have just said, well, we'll leave that for another subject. But he gave his opinion. He was asked his opinion. He gave his opinion. But he said emphatically, the Bible doesn't teach that there's a rapture. No, if I told, him who, if I told you who he was, you wouldn't, you wouldn't laugh. Because he's a great man of God. I still think he's a great man of God. I just think that you've got to understand that great men of God and great women of God can be wrong about some things, yet have a lot of things right. We don't all agree on everything. But one thing we must agree upon is Jesus Christ and Him crucified and the fact that Jesus has invested in us authority to hold back darkness until the appointed time. Do you understand that? That's my truck driving wife. Anyway. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Okay. We got to fight the good fight of faith. We fight it on our knees for the most part. That doesn't mean we don't do practical application of Christianity. It's that, that love that I was talking about, agape, that hospitality to the world. Amen? Where we bring people in, so to speak, into the presence of God, and we feed them the Word of God, and we feed them in the natural. We do whatever we got to do to win one heart at a time to further the kingdom of God, because pretty soon... Night is coming when no man can work. And so because of the hopelessness out there, we must fight against that hopelessness. So I'll say this to you. If you can't tolerate watching certain things on, in the news or on you know, the Internet or whatever, and it, it, it keeps you in a constant state of depression and hopelessness, you need to shut that stuff off, and you need to get into your Word, and you need to pray, and you need to worship God. I didn't say you shouldn't be informed, but, you know, there's being informed and there's being saturated. I guess there's a new, what's that new term that they have now, being drenched in the Spirit, you know, soaking? We need to soak in God's presence. We need to be drenched in His presence. We don't need to be drenched in the hopelessness of the world. Because without us, the, ho the hope that people need in the world, they won't get it. You know, but what he talks about the glory. He was talking about the glory. I wish he'd explain it a little bit more. I've taught on it a whole lot, of, uh, a lot here at this church. The glory has a lot to do, a lot more than this woo-woo stuff out here. That's there too. But the glory, the glory has to do with the anointing of God on our lives. Because a lot of people aren't going to have their eyes open and see rainbow colors and all that kind of stuff and the glory roll in. They're going to see the glory on you. And if you read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 where it talks about us going from glory to glory and that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, which we talked about last Wednesday, and the eyes of your understanding being enlightened to the hope of your calling and your inheritance. 
You know, you need to understand that the glory that people are going to see on you is you being able to negotiate a hopeless world and still have the joy of the Lord and still have something not only in the physical or natural to give to, to people that are hopeless and hurting, but to be able to give the anointing to people. The anointing is invested in you and I. It's not just in the pastors. I wish people would get it. I, I'm really in that stage where it's like, I want to see the people of God understand and know that they have authority and power to cast demons out of their house. They got the authority and power to, to take uh, authority over demons that are going to try and come in through people in our town. We're gatekeepers, church. This church is a gate church. That means you're a part of it. We're living stones, anointed and set up. And where, where living stones are anointed and set up, therein is the house of God, the gate of heaven, where angels ascend and descend. This is a thin place, as Pastor Craig calls it. Every church that calls Jesus Lord and really believes in the authority that God gave them, every Christian sitting in those churches, it's not just Victorious Life Church holding up the, the, the atmosphere of hope in, in Hutchinson and Reno County and wherever else we get to minister to. It's every church that calls upon the name of the Lord and believes in the Word of God. It's every individual believer. There are people's souls out there that you're called to reap, Brother Allen. And you've got to be in that place where you can, where you can distinguish between uh, what is the, the influence of those evil spirits and the influence of the power of God. And you've got to make a choice. Which one am I going to channel through me? Which one am I going to let come through me? Am I going to let one drag me down and get me depressed because I have a few things in my life that aren't working right? Like my health may not be the perfect health that it is. Well, I can't do anything till I got perfect health. My finances aren't perfect. Well, I can't do anything till, I, till my finances are perfect. And you need to remind me at the end to pray for your son because I'll probably forget, even though you put that up here. Hallelujah. I don't know, man. I just think it's time for the body of Christ, even though we've heard these messages over and over again, to start walking in it. Yeah. To be fearless when it comes to the devil. To recognize the devil and not placate him. I, man, I've got to be careful because I don't want I'm in under the anointing. You can get a little cocky, and I don't want to get cocky. Because I guarantee you, me and you are no match for any demon without the Holy Ghost and without the Word of God, without the knowledge of the authority that God has given us. But I'm telling you, when you're walking, I mean, I'm not talking about being perfect in the will of God, but walking in the will of God into the point of where you've received Christ as your Savior, you understand that you have authority, you're, you're all about the Great Commission to whatever level that you allow yourself to get involved with it, you better be involved in it in some way because you're going to have rewards. But at that level you walk in, the enemy knows who you are. If you really get down on your knees and pray, don't, don't be fooled and think that the enemy doesn't know who you are and won't challenge you. He will. He'll try to get to your kids. He'll try to do things. You cannot be in fear. What you got to do is stand up and bind him. And you can't let the things that, that attach themselves to you or to your family keep you from doing the will of God. You go on afraid. You go on sick. You go on... Uh, in a financial stupor until God takes you out because your hope is that, that in the future, if you can't receive it right now, your hope is that you're going to get a breakthrough and this season of whatever you're in will pass. But you got to be faithful in the season you're in, whether it be good times or bad times. And you got to get that moxie in you. Now, not some of you got it in you that are here. But let me tell you something. You need to be able to transfer that to other people. It's time that the body of Christ, uh, you know, quit drinking milk and start eating some meat and be able to give some milk to other people. You know, get off the spiritual, you know, milk machine and start feeding people uh, some milk and you eat that meat. And make sure you digest it good so that you can give out the word of God to these people. Right? Start binding devils. You know, when you come into a room and you sense, you should be sensitive. I feel some devils in here. I don't want you to go around being all conscious of devils all the time, like, where are they at? Like you're, you know, uh, you know what's his name? That, that detective, that English detective, 
Sherlock Holmes in the spirit. Where's the demons at? <laughs> we don't need to be that. We don't need to be spooky. But you know, when you walk into a place and you sense that something's not right, God has given you that, that inner knowing inside of you, and you need to stop and go, hmm, what's not right about this? And, you know, maybe you can't cackle off in tongues right there in the middle of the store real loud and crazy, but, but you, can, you can definitely start binding in Jesus' name. I broke the power off that woman. Or you can walk around the corner and go, God, touch that lady. Break that off that child. Do you ever drive down the street and see people that you know are despondent and in despair and you can see the hopelessness on them? Uh, if you can't, just drive down 4th Street sometime. Just drive down there. You see the little hookers walking around with their little backpacks down the street. Oh, I never see that because you're not looking. You go, you go by the Roach Motel down there. I know it sounds funny and judgmental, but it is. And it's full, of, it's full of demons when you drive by it. If you can't see them, then take my word for it. I see them. You know, and you don't always see them in the natural, but you can see their effects. And you can feel the ripple as you drive down the street and you pass that, that little place where they've taken uh, up habitation. And you go by, and now you need to be really careful. Because we, we did a few things back in the day where we'd go by and, 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 and we cursed and a couple places burnt down, and so I figured out that isn't the right thing to do. You say, was that because you, I don't know, but it happened. So I started saying, close down. You gotta take into consideration people's, you know, livelihood too, but, but you know, we have the power to break, and I, you know, I know some of these places, I wasn't the only one praying. I know where my kids used to uh, take karate, there was one of those adult stores next door, and it took a couple years of praying my kids would do it, I would do it, my wife would do it, Thomas and Cheryl would do it. It eventually was gone. It took a while, but it was gone. There was a place that was a, was a little party place uh, out there on 4th Street uh, years ago, and it was real annoying late at night. Drunks would come down my sister's street, drive their cars fast, and they would raise cane, and you could hear them screaming and yelling out there. We started praying that that thing would close down and turn back into a Mexican restaurant. Maybe you know where I'm talking about. Right? You say, oh, you didn't do that. I believe we did. I believe we did. I believe that there was a lot of us that during the time when some people wanted to come in here and start trouble in our town, that we went around the town and we closed up the gates of the city in the name of Jesus and bound the devils from being able to come in here and do their work. And guess what they weren't able to do? They weren't able to do it because people were praying. And there were, there were prophetic people that went, that went in the, the spirit of the Lord and did things, did operations in the spirit, and, and stuff wasn't allowed to happen. Amen? Amen? Do you believe that about your region? I don't know. I know I got, I got some prayer warriors in here that when they start going, oh, no, a tornado's coming towards us. We bind it in Jesus' name, and it usually goes around, don't it? You know? Um, people can say, well, it's just because we're in a depression of, you know, and the Indians said this. Maybe all that's true too, but I can tell you this much. Uh, I've had, I've had uh, hail stop immediately when I prayed because I, I didn't want to have to re-roof my house. Well, I would have had Craig and Nate do it, but still, I didn't want to do it. It's a mess and it, you know. But there's been a couple times I prayed and it started getting harder. <laughs> that's when you know you got resistance. But there is resistance out there. But we're people uh, of faith. It's what we believe. We're defined by what we believe, and that's faith. What we expect, that's hope. How we relate towards others, that's love. Faith is our foundation. Hope is our attitudinal anchor. Love is our motive. We're the Jesus nation. The church has got to be characterized by a living faith in this hour. You know, sometimes the church drifts away from faith, and gets caught up in dead dogma. And we've had, you know, we've had different times uh, in, in church history where it's become legalistic. And, you know, you got to be really careful. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's, there's liberty. I was reading in, in Hebrews 3 and 4 today about the rest of God. Anybody ever do any studying in Hebrews uh, 3 and 4 about the rest of God, entering into the rest of God? 
You know, we pray about the secret place of the Most High. There's a place in God where there's rest. The secret place of the Most High, you can find rest. All these things I just was talking about, faith, hope, and love, amen. All these things are found in that secret place or in that rest of God. And those that have entered into the rest of God have ceased from their own labors. What does that mean? They quit working, they're retired now? That's not what it's talking about. It's basically, on the basic level, it's talking about you're no longer working for your salvation. You work because you are saved. You enter into a rest where God has uh, provided a, a rest from you trying to accomplish everything in and of your own self through the, through the element of carnality and striving where you enter into the rest. Praise the Lord, I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. There's therefore now, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, no condemnation to me who will walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free from the law of sin and death. And I rest in that. I don't rest upon the mistakes I make. I don't stay bound up by the mistakes I make when I end up sinning or, or you know, because a mistake is really a sin. You know, when the flesh gets the better of you. It doesn't, you know what people always think, sin's got to be this big, you know, out there thing. It's unbelief for, more, for the most part. The people in, in the days of Moses couldn't enter into the promised land, which is equal to the rest that God had for them. It didn't mean they weren't going to ever do work or cultivate the land or anything. They were going to rest from wandering in the wilderness. They were going to get to have plots of land and build a city and, and uh, have a... Uh, you know, uh, commerce and things and good food to eat and place where there was a land of milk and honey, amen? That was the rest of God. But they couldn't enter in because of unbelief. When, when the first time they came and, and uh, the spies were, the 12 spies were sent out and they saw the sons of Anak or the children of the giants and, and the people of the land were great and they saw themselves as grasshoppers, they were in unbelief, and because of that, they, they quarreled against Moses and against Joshua and Caleb, and, and God says, well, you, you know what? Your carcasses are going to fall in, uh, in, the, in the desert. And so for 40 years, you're, you're going to wander till that generation's gone, and your children will inhabit it, but you won't. And the only people that got to go over there was Joshua and Caleb out of that old generation. Even Moses didn't get to go. Because of unbelief, they couldn't enter into the rest. See, we that are in Christ, we have to keep our focus and our hope in Him alone. Can you say amen? I'm not mad, I'm just preaching hard. So if you think I'm mad, I'm not mad. We're seeing through a glass darkly. You know, if we saw everything and knew everything, that's not faith. Living in this world, we have to walk by faith. You say, well, why did God make it that way? I don't know. Ask him when you get to heaven. Rest in him, though. He's going to cause all things to work together for your good. What about all the bad things I've been through? Well, you know what? If you go through them right, even the bad things work for your good. I use the example of when I was, when I was younger, you know, and, of course, in my day, you could punch somebody and not get stabbed or shot. But I grew up in L.A., you know, and... and uh, we were always rumbling out there in the schoolyard. That's just what young people, young men do a lot of times. Back in my day, now they don't do nothing except talk or shoot you. But, but in my day, you know, if you, if you messed with somebody, you'd get in, a, get in a fist fight and, you know, throw a few blows, get a headlock and say, I give, and that's it. And maybe you'd become friends with them, maybe you wouldn't. But you wouldn't mess with them again for a while because you figured out, yeah, I can't whip him, so I better make him my friend or stay away from him. You know, uh, I learned how to fight when I was little, and uh, after I learned how to fight, I hit a lot of people just just because I wanted to show them I could fight, right? Until three people got me and stomp, monkey stomped me, and I thought, you know what, this hitting people thing is not very fun. I think some of the best the the best uh, lesson you can learn in that respect is, is to, you know for a bully is to get a bloody nose once or twice. And then they go, you know what, this isn't too cool. Maybe I shouldn't do it to other people, right? Uh, so, you know, sometimes uh, going through hard knocks, you learn lessons. 
You know, I mean, some of the stuff my wife and I, and I'm sure all of you have been through it too, you know, in your younger years, your younger married years, the things we've went through, you know, they weren't fun. They're still not fun. But, you know, when we've gone through them together, we've come out stronger together. My wife and my, my relationship is stronger now than it ever was. Back when we first got married, we were in la di da honeymoon land. You know, we didn't, we didn't know we were going to go through a lot. I mean, we were actually going through it back then. We were poor as could be, but we were in love. We didn't care, you know. Uh, but later on, we got kids and things, and stuff started happening, and financial uh, disasters in our country. You know, Reaganomics was good for a lot of people, but it wasn't good for us. But we learned how to stick together. We learned how to make it on almost nothing. You know, a wing and a prayer, baby. And uh, we went through things, and we had things happen physically to us, and we had to trust God for, uh, to make it through. You know, sometimes uh, I've seen healings miraculous like that, and sometimes it's over a period of time. You know, some of you have been through things. You know, Alan, you're, you, you've been a nurse and you've seen people sick and recover, right? And you've seen people come and pray for them. They didn't get miraculously healed right at that instant, but they recovered. And I think faith and medicine helped them, but there's times when, you know, a miracle does happen. And I think it's God's perfect will, but sometimes we're not able to access the perfect will of God in every situation. But we know this, God will cause all things to work together for our good. And we've got to put hope in that. You're going through something right now, you've got to put hope in Jesus Christ. You say, you know what? I'm sick of this season that we're in, in here in America with all these dumb masks and shots and people trying to tell me I can do this or I can't do that. You know, I don't like it either. And, you know, uh, I'm not really sure about everything that's going to happen or is, go is happening. Uh, I know that we're headed towards a, a point in time where there's going to be a closeout of the Gentile uh, times. And when that happens, if you believe like I do, we're going to be raptured out of here. Oh, it, you just got an escape mentality. Yeah, I do, because Jesus said he was going to keep me from the hour of temptation that was going to come upon all the world to try all those that dwell on the earth. So if I'm dwelling on the earth, I'm not, you know... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suffer that temptation of taking a mark. You say, was all this sh stuff the mark of the beast? No, it's the preemption to it all. It's the system being put in place. The, this, this is part of the system right here. This is part of the system. Right now, we can use some of it for good. Amen? Uh, but my point is that we don't focus on this stuff right now. In order to take a mark of the beast, you've got to have a beast that's revealed to you that you bow to in your heart. And then doing that, you renounce God. It's plain in the Bible. If you take the mark of the beast, there's no hope for you. So the mark of the beast isn't a shot. It isn't a credit card. You know, um, I'm not real crazy about them putting little things inside of people's bodies and stuff. But, but until the, the Antichrist is revealed, you can't take the mark. So there's hope right now. Is he here on this earth? I think he probably is. He's probably standing back laughing, can't wait till his time comes. And his spirit and the spirits that, of the Antichrist are pushing to come in. But that doggone church, every time we try to get a foothold... Uh, some Christian rises up and preaches the truth and some sister behind the scenes or brother is down on their knees praying and binding and loosening just like Anna and Simeon were doing. Praying for the salvation of Israel. And God said, you're not going to see death till you get to see the Messiah. Well, they only got to see him as a little baby, but their eyes got to behold him. And see, the Antichrist can't be revealed, can't sit in the temple as God until I'm out of here. Because I'm a part of the restraining force. You're a part of the restraining force. So while it's day, we've got to work while it's day. Because night is coming when no man can work. Because we won't be here. If you don't believe that, then you're not, you don't have hope. Go over, to, go over to Titus. I was going to use this scripture. Right now, you know, I mean, you could try your best to try to teach. But a lot of your teaching comes out in prophetic teaching or preaching because the saints have got to be woke up. They've got to be encouraged. They've got to find their hope in Jesus Christ. They've got to get their minds right and their focus true. 
Because while you're out here away from church, uh, working your job, doing whatever you do, everything is vying for your attention. I said to go over to Titus. Chapter 2. Verse 11. For the grace of God. What is the grace of God? Well, we could go into a long dissertation on that, or we can just, we can just for tonight's purposes, just say it's, it's the divine influence on the heart and the reflection of God outwardly in our lives. Or you could say it's God's divine favor upon you. We know that when we get born again, we get well, what's, what's called a grace package. Just like when you work for a good company and they have benefits, you get a package after uh, so many days of being there for insurance and you know, whatever else they offer, 401ks or you know, whatever it is, right? Has anybody ever got one of those packets? I always give it to my wife because it's really boring to read. Okay? In our grace package, there were things that were given to us as sons and daughters of God. But he says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Now remember, salvation is more. I started to say some of it. It's peace of mind. It's peace between you and God. It's, it's a, a plan for health. Amen? It's a plan for mental health. It's a plan for financial wealth. Now, I'm not talking about big jets and, and 20, uh, you know, mansions. Okay? Nothing against them, but... That's, everybody that finds Christ is not going to have a big jet. Everybody that finds Christ is not going to have a big mansion. Okay, if you have a big mansion, it'll be an orphanage. Just saying. In my opinion. My opinion. I'm not always right about everything, by the way. But it's appeared, the grace of God has appeared that brings salvation to all men. And in that, through the Word of God, and in that, that grace package, as you begin to get the eyes of your understanding enlightened so you know what the hope of your calling is, what is the richness of His great inheritance towards us that believe, amen? When you begin to understand that, it says it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteousness, righteously in a, and godly in this present world. With this thing, see, Jesus said, I'm coming back for, for those that are looking for me, okay? He says, uh, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice he's called God here. He's not a God, he's God, okay? We still believe in the triunity in this church, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but all, those three make up one God, and one God make up those three, and I can't figure it out, neither can you, so let's just accept it by faith, right? right? Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto him, purify, not you, him purify unto himself, a people, okay, so he says, uh, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one despise you. Jesus Christ has purified you in that grace package as long as you receive him by faith and understand that your salvation is secure in him, not in yourself. But I just heard him say that he's purifying a people unto good works. Yeah, you know what? You should, try to, you should try to do the works of Christ. You should, you should do your best to live a godly life. What is that, Pastor? Define it. Well, it'd take me a long time. But I guess you can find a, just a, a kind of a synopsis of it in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, I think it is. You know, verse 16 says, Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. You know, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, against the flesh. These two are contrary to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you want. Okay? But he says, but the fruit of the spirit. And Pastor Craig can always quote it. I can't. But, you know, basically the fruit of the spirit is love. And all the attributes of love. Love, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, self-control. Amen? Amen? All those things, I'm missing some of them, but if you can go over there and you can read them, write them down. That's just one of them I've never memorized. I should, though. 
But do you understand? So what are you saying? Well, we have a blessed hope. Jesus is coming. And while we can work, we should work. Does that mean we're working for our salvation? Once again, absolutely not. But as a Christian, there's certain things I just don't do anymore. There's some things I still do and I'm working on. Most of them are attitudes. Most of them are stupid things that come out of my mouth. <laughs> my wife will look at me every once in a while with this nice love in her eyes, and I'll say something dumb, and she goes, do you always have to say stupid things? <laughs> She's not putting me down. But, you know, Mary, you know how it goes, right? Me and Ken kind of, we kind of got some similarities in things. You know, sometimes we just, we just blurt things out, you know, some of us guys, and I know you girls do too. And, you know, they're not becoming uh, of a man or a woman of God sometimes, but, you know, we're still in the flesh and we get carnal at times. And, and the thing we've been teaching on when we taught about the gifts of the Spirit and so forth and Pentecost is, is to learn to walk in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? And so that, that's the works that I'm trying to do. But, you know, even, even if I can't be Mr. Snazzy Perfect Christian as far as my outward everything, my appearance, my speech, but you know what? Have those people do that all day long and shine bright in front of everybody. I'll take the quiet guy or girl that's out there doing the works of Christ, feeding the poor, taking care of the sick, answering phone calls when people are down and out, and encouraging, in the, encouraging them. You know, taking the time out with the young mothers or the young fathers to speak to them, to help calm somebody down who's, who's going through it mentally. Amen? They'll, that'll put their game aside, their TV aside, uh, their thing aside, and take an hour to talk to somebody when it's not convenient. Amen? Well, that's your job, Pastor. No, it's not. It's our job. My job is to tell you it's your job too. <laughs> Amen? That's why, you know, whenever I'm having prayer lines, I like to get a lot of people up here, especially those that know how to pray and are in faith and know the kind of decorum that we have here. Because you know what? There's things, there's gifts in you that, that maybe I'm not quite, I'm not quite there in my belief ability at that time. We're better together. Somewhere out of four or five people praying for somebody, one of us has got faith for that. We got belief for that. Amen? And the rest of us, we can just lend whatever we got for it. We're better together. We're more powerful together. This is where a lot of these people on, in these YouTube uh, churches and stuff, they're missing it. I'm not saying it's not a good supplement in some cases or it's not good for shut-ins and people that can't get out or during the COVID, you know, scare. But, but uh, when you can make it to church or be a part of a church, you should be a part of one. Had a friend that was living in an area where they didn't have any Pentecostal churches. No word of faith churches. They had Baptist churches. I'm not going to church because all they got is a Baptist church. I said, you're in sin. The Baptist church, does it, do they preach Jesus Christ, him crucified? Yeah. Well, they don't speak in tongues, though. I go, that's not the main thing. And besides that, you need to be a part of, you need to be a, part of a company. Uh, 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 an army, you know, has, is made up of companies of men and units. Amen? You need to be a part of that. You need to be a part of that team. You know, Paul talks in, in uh, language of, of military language and in uh, athletics. Read his word. I mean, he, he uses those, those um, comparatives so that you and I can kind of get an idea of how the body of Christ should function. Amen? That we're, we're, a, we're a communion of saints. We're an organized body, the ecclesia, or ecclesia, you know, however you want to say it, but we are that people that are called out of a greater body of people unto Jesus Christ, and we become a governmental body of authority on this earth. Going back to what I was saying in the beginning, we have authority and we have power, and we're, we have the ability to withhold the powers of darkness out here and to create an atmosphere there's, you know, we don't call, I don't know, maybe some people just use this term and don't really understand it. But to me, when I say a sanctuary, this place is a sanctuary. You know how it got to be a sanctuary? Oh, because we built a building and dedicated it as a church. Well, that's a little bit of it, you know. 
Somebody built a, a church on this corner years and years ago, and there's always been a church here, and it's always been somewhat of a Pentecostal, full gospel type of church. Up to us when it was here at this corner. Every church that's been here operated somewhat in that, in that mindset or that anointing. Amen? So this place has become a lighthouse, a beacon of hope, uh, uh, an oasis of refreshing. Can you say amen? And so there are people that come here and, and they can find peace for at least an hour or two. Amen? Except for maybe when I'm yelling at you like tonight. <laughs> Waking you up if you're not awake. And I'm talking to folks out there too. Glory to God. Especially you that are staying at home that could get up off your rear end and go to church. Except for when you're sick. Amen? But if you don't, we're glad you come and you join in with us and you hear the word of God. But you need to be a part of an army. You need to be a part of a, a team. Glory to God. And so I just thank God for our team here. We got a great team of people. Amen. Uh, this has probably been one of the best uh, organizations of, of Victorious Life Church in these last uh, seven years that we've ever had. We've had a couple of really good ones. We've had a couple that fizzled out. You know, a couple of groups of folks that didn't co weren't cohesive, so to speak. This one is pretty cool. So hope's an anchor to our soul. The Bible says in Psalms 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Why? Because in your grace package, you've, you've been given certain benefits. I was talking about your benefits at work. You know, they'll tell you what you get and what you, you know, what you're going to get if you stick with the company and so forth. Well, in, in the body of Christ, we have benefits. And we have also, the coolest thing that we've been given the right to do is to take those benefits out to people who don't, don't really deserve them, like you didn't deserve them, that aren't a part of, of the body yet, but to go out and heal the sick, raise the dead, you know, cast out demons. We have that, we have that commandment, that commission on us. And in order to fulfill that commission, then we have to have the anointing. And in order to uh, allow the anointing to function properly, we have to have the knowledge. And in order to have the knowledge, we, we've got to get into the book. And, and as we're in the book, we need to pray for our eyes, our spiritual eyes to be open, so that we don't just know it by the, the natural mind or the reading, but that it gets down inside of our hearts and becomes a living word inside of us. So that we have the, the, the tablets of God, the, the Word of God, on, not on stony tablets, but on the fleshly tables of our hearts. What he was talking about, carrying the glory. I've talked about us being a tabernacle. I know the Bible says we're the temple of God, but I said I like to call it the tabernacle of God because the temple is, is stationary and we can't hide behind four walls all the time. We've got to see ourselves as movable tabernacles together and individually. When I go places, people, I'm not bragging. I'm not saying that you can ask my mom, you can ask my wife. You know why they're drawn to me? Because they sense the Spirit of God in me and they sense that they can come talk to me. And I know some of you are just like that too. You think you're just going to go out for a nice little day at the grocery store or wherever you go and, you know, I'm just doing my thing. But then there's somebody there that somehow you connect. And it always turns to Jesus Christ. It always turns to something that, that you give hope to somebody for. I mean, people that are hopeless are drawn. i never forget just the, the time before last that we went to visit Jeremiah. And this happens every time, though. We're, we're in Hawaii, and we're on a catamaran having a nice little cruise. Next thing I know, I'm sitting down next to a, a young married couple, and I start... A marriage counseling, <laughs> counseling them. I don't know how we got, I don't even have a clue how we went there. But we got there. And yet my wife and everybody are over there doing their thing. And I'm over here giving my vacation time to these people and gladly doing it. Because you know what? We're people of hope and people can feel it. They may not even be able to visually see anything or you didn't even really say a whole lot, but they're drawn to you because that intuitive part of them, that spiritual part of them can feel, can sense the anointing of God because you are a movable tabernacle of hope. He talked about the ark being in you. 
You know, I, I don't care about any natural representation of the ark. It's irrelevant right now. The ark is in me. I'm the ark of God. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm that tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. So are you. See, you have to see yourself like that. You have to push your inadequacies aside. You have to push aside the, this, uh, that little voice inside of you that says you can't, you won't, you never will, you're no good for nothing. Some of you don't have that, but you know I had it. But like Joyce Meyer said, and like I've said a couple of times already, go on afraid, go on weak, go on anyway. But go in the power of God and he'll supersede everything. When I walk into my house, and if I feel that there's any evil presence in there, it has to bow its knee to Jesus Christ. And listen, if you've got kids and young people, there's going to be stuff that your, your, your TV and everything is a porthole to hell sometimes. You know, sometimes you ignore it, but when they start making their presence known, then you deal with it. And then you teach your kids what's right and what's wrong. It's like we, Dylan and I were talking about his daughter and some of the stuff at her preschool and I said, you know what? Teach her what's right and what's wrong. Make sure you're involved in knowing what they do there. And, you know, if everything else is good but this is bad, make sure that you, you, you are informed so that when your kid comes home, you can unscrew their brain from whatever they're trying to pump at the schools. I did that with my daughters all the time when they come home. They start telling me about stuff. In fact, the, re the really cool thing is, is they learn it back there. And they go to school and they come home and go, do you know what my teacher said or do you know what this kid said? And I go, well, what did you say? I said, that's not good. God, you know, God doesn't like that. Uh, one of the things my, my, my daughter Madison, when she was in grade school, her teacher goes, she's the first, every time there's a kid that's sick, she lays hands on them and prays for them. Where did she learn that? I know, I know she learns it from us up here. She learned it in the back too. We don't teach our kids back there to just Mary had a little lamb sermon things, you know. We show them that, that Mary's little lamb grew up and became a great man, a God, a great healer, a great prophet, a Messiah, a Savior, amen? We teach them about the men and women of God that went about doing good, amen? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalms 13, 12, hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire comes, in other words, when faith comes, it is like a tree of life. David said in Psalms 27, 13, I'd have fainted. This is one of my favorite ones. I have to tell myself this all the time. When things are looking bad, when things aren't panning out, I'd have fainted unless I believed, unless I believed, unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen? I'm not just looking for things to get better when I get to heaven. I know it's going to be great there. But I'm down here right now. I need things to get better now. And God has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. But, but the, the thing is, the but is, but it's through the knowledge, the accurate revelation knowledge of God's Word, the knowledge that, that, doesn't, that doesn't stay here but goes to here and becomes spirit and life, for God is a spirit. Those that worship him, those that communicate with him, those that, that are able to draw upon his power, his anointing, his hope, amen, they must do it through worship and spirit and truth. How do you worship God? Worship isn't just a song. It's great. It's part of it. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is being able to tap into God when nobody else can tap into God. I thank God that when I've been in a place where I can't get a hold of God, there's been other people that can get a hold of God for me. Have I ever been in despair with the kind of knowledge I have now? I absolutely have. I've had people sitting in here right now talk me out of giving up when I wanted to give up. Pastor, you wanted to give up? Yeah, if they were to, if they were to speak up right now, if, I don't want them to, but if they were, they could tell you the night they called me or I called them. I think they called me. And I was ready to go, I'm done with this. I'm done with this whole thing. No, you can't. You won't. They're telling me I can't. Amen? And then you're thinking, well, I can't let them down. Even if I don't want to do it, you know, what about them? And there's this thing inside of you, if you're a true Christian, a man or a woman of God, you're like, well, it's one thing to let myself down and let God down on my behalf. 
although God's never going to be let down. But it's another thing to give somebody an out, a, a, an out or an excuse to quit too or to, to, to leave them holding the bag and not, not giving them backup when they backed you up. It'll change your perspective. Amen? It'll take you out of you and put you over here from being subjective to objective. Go, well, you know. That's the same thing you got to do when you're dealing with people that really annoy you or irk you. Sometimes instead of just taking the hurt and taking the whole I'm angry thing, which is really hard to do, by the way, for me anyway, just to step back and go, well, why are they like that? What, what is the deal? What, why are they doing that? What is motivating them? You know, but as long as you're so subjective and it's all just about you, okay, that, that's, that, that in itself is, you know, it's selfishness. And you say, but you've been an unselfish person your whole life. Now, there's times when I'm selfish. There's times when you're selfish. Just is. And, you know, it happens to all of us. It's not, it's not uncommon. You know, but, but Jesus said, through Paul, he said that uh, there's no temptation. I think it's, what is it, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13, or 2 Corinthians 10, 13. I don't remember the, it's one of those two. Corinthian books. This is no temptation that's come to you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be, a t be tempted above that which you are able, but with the temptation will give you a way of escape or the ability to bear up under it. God will cause all things to work together for the good of those that love him, to those that have made the choice to be called according to his purpose. You know, when I forget that I'm called to his purpose, then something's got to shake me up. Somebody's got to encourage me. Somebody's got to wake me up. Somebody's got to remind me of the hope that I have in Jesus Christ so that I can remind other people of the hope. Right now, people are hopeless. And it, it, is, it is the inclination of most of us to jump right. And I do it. I'm guilty. I'm, preach I'm preaching to you, but I'm preaching to myself because I get guilty of getting right along in there with them and griping about the things that bring hopelessness instead of the answer and the knowledge that things are going to go the way they are. Does it mean that there's no hope for things to, to get back to some kind of normalcy or, or to be better than they were for a period of time? There is hope because we don't know if Jesus is coming back tomorrow or 10 years from now or, God forbid, 50 years from now. As far as in my heart, the way God put it in my heart, no man knows the day or the hour, but I've kind of believed that I'm going to be alive or it's going to happen, the rapture will happen in my generation or there will be people of my generation alive. I tell my mom all the time because she's going to be 91 in a couple of weeks. I tell her, just hang in there, Mom, and we'll go in the rapture together. You won't have to die, maybe. We'll just go to the way things are looking. But, you know, things have looked like this before. But they've never had all the signs that we've had. Folks, there's stuff happening right now. It, uh, they're not talking about it on your normal TV, but there's earthquakes and volcanoes uh, in a magnitude of... of a frequency like never before. And you say, well, that's just because we got better instruments. That's probably true to a degree, but I'm telling you, things are going on right now. I mean, there is oppression going on in countries right now. You know about them. I'm not trying to bring this in a conclusion of hopelessness again, but our hope is the fact that when we see these things, we're to look up and rejoice because our redemption's drawing nigh. So maybe things will turn around, but if they don't, are you prepared to, to hang in there? Okay, God forbid that those of us that preach pre-tribulation rapture are wrong. I know, in my heart, I know I'm not, but what if I was? Does that mean we should give up hope? Because somehow God's going to take us through it, if, if that would be the case. I totally don't believe that. But I'm just saying, will we only hang out with God and go for God because he's going to protect us from anything and everything that's bad? I think if you look across the world, there are Christians in tribulation right now. It may not be the great tribulation, but there's places of tribulation. Christians have been uh, uh, persecuted throughout the ages in horrendous, horrendous ways. So, you know, what, what I do, with the help of my wife, 
I try to live one day at a time the best I can. Amen? Uh, and more and more, I'm trying to find things to be thankful for in the midst of things that are hopeless. And one of the things that I can be very thankful for, besides my family, my wife, my church, my God, is the knowledge of God's word of how things end. If you read this Bible very carefully, in the end, we win. And even during the times where things are looking bad, we still overcome. And thanks be to God that gives us the triumph through Jesus Christ. My hope is in Him. My hope is predicated on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. Amen? Do you love Jesus tonight? I mean, you should take this hope. You should take it to people that are hopeless. And I know you do, because some of you tell me about the, the little stories of uh, the engagements you have with people at, where, when you go to different places. And it's so encouraging to know that we have people that are sensitive to God's Spirit that'll stop what they're doing in the store, they'll stop what they're doing on their jobs, and will minister to somebody. They'll be in the airport somewhere, they'll be sitting next to somebody, and they recognize a divine appointment. <laughs> Amen. Not a coincidence, but a God incidence. And it's exciting. It's exciting. It's, it's so cool when you all of a sudden recognize God is using you to talk to somebody. And that anointing comes on you. Then you can understand what it's like to get up behind a pulpit and preach to people the Word of God. Because it's the same one-on-one. -on -one. It is. It really is. It's cool. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for this people. Thank you for the great hope we have through Jesus Christ. Lord, we're encouraged in you tonight. Lord, we know that the time is drawing near for your, for your second coming. And we're, we're hope, we're, we're looking towards that hope, Lord. But we're not looking towards it just to stand still and do nothing. We're looking with hope to your coming, but we're ready to tell people about that blessed hope, Lord, and that glorious appearing. Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you just fill us with your Holy Spirit day by day as we seek your face. Uh, and encourage us so that we can encourage others. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. So God bless you, and let's pray for Sue.